Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University in North Carolina, former Merchant Mariner, and an instructor in Maritime Industry Policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And welcome to this episode of What's Going On Off Queen Dow. This is the He Rubbed You and Rubbin' Son is Racing Edition. Uh, today, we've got a little bit something different to talk about here because we're talking about an incident that took place not in the Suez Canal, but off the port of Qingdao. And Qingdao is off the coast of China. So let's head on over there and see what's going on. So this is the story that came out here the other day. Uh, oil tanker, A Sympathy, crashes outside a Chinese uh, Qingdao port, spills oil. Uh, you can see the report here. This is coming out through the Hellenistic uh, News uh, this is industry news from uh, 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 Hellenistic Shipping News, excuse me. Uh, China's Shandong Maritime Safety Administration said on Tuesday that the tanker A Symphony carrying around 1 million barrels of oil has spilled oil in the Yellow Sea. The Suez Mez tanker was last seen near the Qingdao port. Live shipping data on Rutley Elkon show. The tanker last called at Lingli International Transshipment Hub near Malacca in peninsular Malaysia earlier this month. We know that Qingdao was involved with another ship. This story from Splash 247 goes a little bit further. Oil pouring into the sea off Qingdao is Bulker Ram Suez Max. Uh, the story goes a little bit further here. Uh, NGM Energy owned Supermax tanker A Sympathy has sustained damage off the Chinese port of Qingdao, causing it to oil, uh, spill oil in the Yellow Sea. Uh, it goes on here reports that the Panamanian flag 35,200 deadweight ton bulk carrier Sea Justice collided with a 272 meter long tanker while it was anchor off the Qingdao port. Here is A Symphony right here. She's showing on Marine Traffic, our buddies at Marine Traffic, always keeping us up to date on information regarding vessels. Uh, again, if you're going to have an app, I, I always use Marine Traffic. I enjoy it immensely, and I think it's a great uh, app for having it. Uh, see her at anchor here. Let's go zoom out here a little bit and get a better uh, view here. Move that over. Uh, one of the things that you may wonder, it looked like a symphony hasn't been moving. I mean, if you look at her, her past track has her basically sitting right there. Does not move. Yeah, she's just swinging an anchor. You can see that zoom in right there of her right there. Uh, you can see her basically sitting right there. So she's been sitting there the entire time. So there is a potential for the ship to have been hit at anchor. Uh, and believe it or not, that does happen. Uh, it does happen at times. This is a larger version off Queen Dow and, and give you an idea where Queen Dow is. Uh, port up here in uh, northern China, right here off the Yellow Sea, uh, across from South Korea, uh, right in this area right here. Uh, it's heavily trafficked, as you can see, and, and the line going in and out of Queen Dow is quite extensive. The vessel she was hit by is this one here, Sea Justice. The Splash 247 and other reports have her listed as a bulker, but she appears to be a general cargo carrier. That's what she's listed as here, as a general cargo carrier, not a bulk carrier. So uh, maybe a little bit of confusion about that. This is her latest position, according to Marine Traffic. She is not in the area anymore. This was pinged uh, as of, let's see what this is, received as of uh, 1603 UTC time. And if you go to her past track here, she was, uh, let's show you her past track, where she was. You'll see where the collision took place. It's pretty obvious from this track line exactly where the collision took place. Now, it may sound weird for a, a vessel underway to hit a vessel that is at anchor. That actually is not that unusual at times. Hang on, we're having problems loading it up here. Let's go back. I just loaded a second ago, and of course, it's not going to work for me right now. So we'll try it again. Uh, but believe it or not, vessels at anchor, depending on visibility and issues in 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 traffic, uh, it, it's unfortunately very uh, very likely for vessels to get hit even while sitting at anchor. And of course, the vessel at anchor is is not the vessel that's going to be responsible for this. It is the vessel that is underway that will be responsible for it. Here we go. Here's the track. I was able to pull it up. Uh, you'll see her heading into Qingdao right here, and then right over here where we zoom in here. You can see basically where the collision happened. You'll see the vessel comes to a, basically a screeching halt right here. And here you see a sympathy right there where the collision took place. Could be reduced visibility, uh, could be a variety of different issues, could be traffic issues, but really hitting an anchored vessel that's not moving is wholly the responsibility of the vessel that does the collision. And the collision was substantial. This is a uh, image here that was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, taken by tanker trackers. Uh, they were able to get this image. Uh, this is rubbing. Uh, this is more, not just rubbing. This is actually a, almost looks like a T-bone 
uh, where she got hit pretty substantially at this point. And so we do have an oil spill at this time off the port of Qingdao. Uh, she's pretty far off, actually. So she's in an anchorage pretty far off the coast. Again, if we go back here to where she's at, she's a good distance off. It's not like she's in the uh, inner harbor here at all. She's a, a good probably about 50, 60 miles off the coast right there. And again, you'll see that there are anchorages here for some vessels. Uh, this is off another port right there. She could be waiting to get into Qingdao. She was scheduled to go into Qingdao. Uh, she'll be out of this anchorage out here, maybe holding another tanker out here, a few other tankers out in this area right here. So she's probably just sitting there anchoring. Not clear why, again, this vessel decided to run right into her. But again, this is what accidents are all about. So now they're going to be battling an oil spill off the port of Qingdao. Uh, one of the things that they'll attempt to do very immediately is get booms, these these floating uh, uh, objects that kind of can encircle the vessel, keeps the oil contained. Oil is lighter than water. It floats on top. If you can get the boom around it, you can keep the oil inside. The other thing they'll try to do is transfer oil off the vessel, uh, depending if she's coming in to China as she was. If you look at her track here, or, or actually her ports, she was coming in from uh, uh, Malta, it looks like. So not exactly clear if she's loaded or not loaded. She probably picked up fuel somewhere, but we're not clear yet on that. Uh, but if she's having an oil spill right now, and again, we go back to, to this report from Splash 247, saying that, that she is having an oil spill, that we know that's happening. All crew members of the Liberian flag, 150,000 deadweight tank tanker have been reported safe. Said that local oil spill response teams had to be employed to contain the oil spill and begin cleanup operations. So ever since... Exxon Valdez in 1989, you have vessel response plans of how to deal with oil spills. And so there'll be issues to be taking place right here. Hopefully they'll be get the oil, minimize the damage. She's out in the in the uh, East China Sea. Uh, obviously, any oil spill can be hazardous to the environment. And so they want to go ahead and get a jump on this as immediately as fast as they can. One of the things that we've seen over the course since the big oil spills of the 80s and 90s is much safer oil transportation. But again, you're talking about 50,000 vessels over 1,000 gross tons operating on the world's oceans on a daily basis. Accidents will happen. I, I, had a, I remember taking a collision avoidance class. When you, when you learn how to navigate vessels and be up on the bridge, you learn a couple of things. One of the things you learn is, is on your radars, you have something called the collision avoidance system, a CAS. It's basically a, a sophisticated radar that plots every vessel that are on your radar scope. It, it computes their speed, their courses, and it gives you a track line. And what you can do is project out those track lines. And I had a, an instructor who always told me, he goes, well, you know, the key in navigating or the key in collision avoidance is just not to be in the same spot with somebody else at the same time. And as simplistic as that actually sounds, it's actually the truth. It's, it's, you have to do that. Now, there are rules of the road to follow. There are rules of navigation you have to follow. There's procedures. You know, if you're on the left side of a vessel and you're showing them your starboard side, there's certain provisions that you do. There's always rules of the road. But then there's the point of when you're in extremis. In other words, no actions have taken to alleviate you of the collision. You can do whatever you need to do. And in this scenario, and especially again, in this track, it doesn't look like that they were either cognizant of the asymphony. And it could be, you know, you know, people not paying attention. They just weren't. It could be reduced visibility, fog. They weren't looking at their radar, didn't expect for an oil tanker to be anchored 50 to 60 miles out from a port and they just plowed right into her. And, and, and again, this is the issue we have with accidents. Most accidents at sea can be attributed back down to the human level. Uh, this would be a made on watch. Maybe the master was on the bridge. We don't know. They would not have a pilot on board at this point. They're not anywhere near Queen Dow. So this is obviously on the, on the sole responsibility of, of the ship at this time. And then if, and if a sympathy was at anchor as she was, she, she, can't maneuver. She, she's not in a way to maneuver. You signal yourself by anchor. And again, ships have radar. They have these AIS systems. So you should be able to see who's out there. You should be able to communicate. You know, back in the day when you couldn't really know who a vessel was, you had to call vessels and, and give their approximate position. But now, you know, click of the button, you hit AIS and say, hey, A Symphony, this is, I forget the other name of the other vessel. But you'd be able to call them and talk to them directly on your VHF, very high frequency uh, radio. You're always monitoring channel 16. That's your guard channel. Everyone's on channel 16 all the time. You usually have multiple VHS, VHF radios on a bridge in case you have to monitor multiple channels. But you, you know that's the that's the channel that everyone's supposed to guard and monitor at all times. And again, here we have a collision that's resulting in an oil spill right now off the coast of China. Just again, a, a poor situation. Hence the uh, you know racing is rubbing. Unfortunately, accidents will happen. 
Meanwhile, uh, our, our favorite vessel, again, what's going on in the Suez, uh, Suez Canal uh, jam a wake-up call to prepare for potential disruptions. This, again, is from Hellenic Shipping News. Uh, further story here about what's going on with the Suez Canal. Started talking here about the blockage of the artery, talking about how much it's impacting the economy. And again, this is April 27th, so today th this came out. And one of the things they start talking about here is jam up as imports. And what's this going to do to the global supply chain? Come down here, DP World Ports Operators, uh, who's one of the biggest uh, operators of ports around the world, uh, is basically talking about the fact that this is going to cause backlogs. We're going to see it. I think they talk about it in here. We have to be a part of the supply chain, our own spare parts of the supply chain. So today we, we can do an end-to-end -end solution from the factory floor to the consumer door. In other words, people have to start thinking about how they're going to improve their supply chains because supply chains are dependent on the global commerce. And when global commerce gets interdicted because of a grounding in the Suez, because of an oil spill off the coast of China, because of COVID that's causing backlogs in ports, you see that play out here. And so we were seeing this played out on a world stage. Um, Maritime Executive had a great article, Ever Given What Happens Now. This is again a couple of days ago, and I can't remember if I mentioned it or not, but this goes through kind of what's going on with Ever Given, everything from the detention by the Suez Canal Authority to general average being declared, the legal issues on there and the cargo on the vessel. One of the things that they're trying to do is get the, the cargo separated from the vessel be able to get a bond placed by the owners of the cargo, about 10% of the cargo value placed to be able to get the cargo off. They can move the vessel up to Port Said, offload it at the APM terminal. But again, they're going to have to transload that onto other vessels, which is transportation costs on top of transportation costs. So it's going to get really expensive uh, to get this cargo uh, off the vessels. And uh, we're kind of seeing that manifest itself right now. We're just we're just seeing this kind of really be uh, uh, the issue here for coming in right now. And so this is going to be a, a larger issue as this develops. So the conclusion of the story, I think, is really interesting. While the Ever Given has been freed from the blocking of the banks of Suez Canal, its owners are finding that they're still very much lodged in the quagmire of legal and insurance issues. For Ever Given, the transit through the canal is not yet over in more than one sense. And I think that's true. We've talked about this repeatedly. Another great story came out. This is from uh, American Shipper. Talks about the impact on U.S. importers. So everyone asks, what's on board Ever Given? What's in the containers on board? Does anybody know? Uh one of the things is one of these uh, providers, uh, uh, E2Open, which is a supply chain management software provider, uh, estimates that approximately 85% of Ever Given is loaded. She was, she's at about 85 uh, capacity, and they're tracking about 10% of the overall load on board. So they got visualization on the load that's on there right now. And one of the things they started to do was, was look at impact to world trade by container. This is not what's on Ever Given, but they're seeing here world trade that was stopped by the Ever Given blockage. And so they basically provided just a general idea of some of the stuff that's that's being blocked. Household personal goods. You know, these are containers. So there are 7,000 containers going from China to the UK, for example. Uh, waste paper. This is from the US to India, 11,000 containers. Construction material, Belgium to China. Uh, textile, automotive uh, uh, components here, China to the UK, China, Germany to China, food products, India to the US. Again, US, again, a lot of US stuff in here because again, these ships just aren't going to Felixstowe, Hamburg, and um, um, Felixstowe, Hamburg, there was another port they were going to and everything. Oh, Rotterdam, Rotterdam. Uh, they're being transloaded on. Beer, Netherlands to uh, China right there. So, you know, there's 641 cases, uh, you know, TUs of Heineken <laughs> that are going there. That's going to get a little bit skunky if that beer doesn't get delivered on time or isn't properly uh, uh, cooled. So obviously there, there are issues at play here, and this gives you a little bit of an indication of what's going on here. So I thought this was a great article, one to kind of really take a look at and see the impact. Again, the reason we don't know what's in Evergreen's, uh, Evergreen, Evergiven's uh, uh, containers is because they're proprietary. They're, they're owned by private firms and loaded by, by freight forwarders. Uh, again, the ship has a manifest. It has to provide that manifest to ports it goes through. It has to provide those manifests when they offload. And again, the customs, insurance, and, and uh, inspection authorities in all the countries will look at it. I'm going to put a special video together on what happens in port terminals. How do containers, you know, how do you deal with containers? Are they scanned? Are they open? What happens in them? Because I get a lot of questions about that. So I'm going to be interested to follow that up. Some other stories real quick that are, again, ramifications of what's going on. 2020 sees a huge spike in shipping containers lost at sea. So we already have 
eighteen thousand boxes lost on every ever given stuck in the Suez. But one of the things we saw throughout twenty twenty was was these ultra large container ships losing losing containers again. This is one Apis. Looks like a, a, a bad Jenga puzzle right here on board. But that's the problem. Those those containers just spilled over. And we see that in this this story at G Captain goes into great detail talking about all the containers that have been lost and how basically that this is ex eclipsing what is the norm. Uh, one Apis alone lost more in one voyage than is typically lost in an entire year. And she was not alone. And there has to be issues with properly loading these vessels, securing the containers, following tracks that don't put them into rough water and extreme. We know weather predicting. We know the shortest route between China and the United States takes you all the way up through the Aleutians, believe it or not, because that's a great circle. The world's not flat. It's a big globe. You know, straight across the Pacific, you know, close to Hawaii is actually really long and it costs a lot of extra money. And so ships want to go the shortest route. The problem with going the shortest route up in the North Pacific gets rough, especially in wintertime. And that's one of the things we see. Uh, how are the container companies doing? Talked about this with uh, John Conrad over at G Captain on this week's G Captain Weekly, which is up and available. If you go over to G Captain, you can see John and I talk about this week in business news and shipping. Uh, it's also available on the G Captain YouTube page. So head on over there. I'll have a link to it in the, in the show notes. But basically, shipping companies are doing great. Doing great. They're not doing as well as they were prior to 2007, 2008. But man, they're doing good. They're on an uptick right now. And if you look at the, the money being laid out here, uh, this is the Q1 reports, the quarter one of 2021 reports are all being done. If you follow these stocks, they have these Q1 reports, uh, Q2, Q3, Q4. Uh, but the Q1 is, is showing, you know, here's Mayor showing a Q1 unaudited revenue of $12.4 billion. And then if you start talking about EBITDA, which is, uh, uh, this is the economy before in, uh, uh, income tax, uh, debt and assessment. I always forget what EBITDA stands for here. Let me, let me, let me look because I'll get, I'll get dinged up. Earning before income taxes, depreciation and amortization. That's what EBITDA stands for. And uh, without the uh, uh, debt and amortization is EBIT. So it gives you an idea of how much profits they're making, basically. And you can see they, they're doing good. Maersk, the Danes are, are quite happy. Uh, they're making money and all the container lines are, are, are making money today. Not as much as they were prior to 2007, 2008 when the, when the economy crashed. But again, we're also in a different position in 2007, 2008 today because we're running with these much larger vessels. Uh, we're seeing a lot of shipping companies now start investing in new vessels. When 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 the market was down, that's what we're seeing there right now. Now we're seeing companies start investing in vessels. Weird time. The market's kicking back up again. You usually don't see them invest in vessels now. It's it's the opposite. You know, when the market's slow, that's when they like to buy because they get ships cheap. Now, when you're buying ships and the market's up, it's expensive. Uh, this is another one over at Freight Waves. Trans-Pacific uh, deteriorating brace for shipping tsunami. Man, that's a great term. That, that shouldn't cause panic in, in, in anyone's minds. What are they talking about? Restocking, uh, driving volumes higher. You know, people want to restock everything. They want to get back up to where they were, which means their backlogs. And those backlogs are causing problems. We see it getting worse. We see it uh, increasing. We see the, 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 the delay at the ports of LA Long Beach. There was a story about Oakland now being delayed. The Alameda facility is being delayed. Same thing as is, is going to resonate over to Seattle. The problem is Oakland and Seattle do not have the rail and, and road systems to get the containers and, and equipment out into the interior of the U.S. that L.A. Long Beach has. But the problem is L.A. Long Beach is over, over jammed right now. And so it's just getting difficult to get all this stuff up. And one of the things we're seeing is contract rates up sharply. Uh, one of the things that happened whenever given one aground is a lot of firms, Maersk, for example, stop taking orders. They stopped basically booking routes because they didn't know what, what the impact was going to be. Uh, now they've opened the books back up. They're they're placing orders, but the books are filling up fast. I mean, you know, to put an order on the Trans-Pacific route right now, you're looking pretty far out right now to do it. And the other issue you have is import, you know, is basically how do you get the stuff out of the United States back overseas? And that's all having an impact. This story does a great job of, of going into detail with it. Here's one. This is the kind of a, a follow-up on that. Maersk doubles year-end net profit guidance amid exceptional container market situation. Again, at a container ship going around in the Suez, close global trade for six days, 12% of the world trade. And here are the container firms all sitting there going, man, you know what? It's a great year. 
and be, again because shipping is different than consuming and and, and when there's a disruption it, it will jack prices up and it's very good for them uh last couple of story here or last story i want to show you is this one this is over in uh, maritime executive video iranian vessels harass u.s coast guard vessels on patrol in the arabian gulf so, you know, one of the things we've been seeing recently is a spur of attacks on vessels. There was recently a, a, an alleged attack on an Israeli-owned car carrier in the Gulf of Oman. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that style of attack. There was just an attack uh, yesterday on a, on a vessel, a, a vessel off the port of Yanbu uh, in, in the Red Sea. Uh, and so we're seeing these escalations, particularly between Israel and Iran. It's very similar to the 1980s tanker war. If you go back to the 1980s, Iran and Iraq, the war that was going on, they were lobbing bombs and, and Exocet missiles into the Persian Gulf. And what the victims of those attacks were tankers, basically tankers going through. Uh, vessels sunk, vessels hit. Uh, it was it was bloody. Uh, hundreds died in, in that conflict. The U.S. got kind of wrapped into it with its vessels getting wrapped into it. The U.S. Stark got hit by a nexus. Hit. Samuel B. Roberts got hit by a mine. Uh, a lot of issues were going on. This issue right here is a continual issue by the Iranian uh, uh, Navy. Well, not the Navy. It's their Republican Guard, basically. I'm going to play this video. This is a U.S. Coast Guard. U.S. Coast Guard is actually in the Persian Gulf. Uh, unbeknownst to most people, the U.S. Coast Guard is actually forward deployed. They have a series of Coast Guard cutters in the Persian Gulf. Coast Guard is the law enforcement uh, element of the U.S. military. The U.S. Navy doesn't have the ability, basically, to board vessels in less than time of war. They're, they're not a, a law enforcement agency. I just want to show you something. This is, this is, just to put this in context, this is the Coast Guard cutter here. It's a 110-foot cutter. They're about to be replaced by these new 154-foot uh, uh, fast response cutters, brand new vessels built down in Bollinger in, in, in the Gulf Coast. Great vessels, just beautiful, beautiful vessels. The 110s were great vessels, but they're old, really old, and they need replacing. This is an Iranian trimaran right here. Very, very kind of interesting vessel. But one of the things you're seeing right here is she's cutting across the bow of the Coast Guard cutter here. Now, I, I should say something here. Cutting across the bow in, in this type of crossing situation, uh, this vessel, the, co the Iranian vessel, has the right of way. Uh, the, the, the Coast Guard cutter is supposed to turn and give its way. The problem is the Iranian intentionally does this. They, they intentionally cut across the bow of, of, of the Coast Guard cutter. And you'll see a big, huge puff of smoke come up. That is the uh, uh, Coast Guard cutter backing down real hard here. You start seeing the smoke come out now. You see the smoke coming out now. That's their diesel engines kicking back. They're probably backing down to avoid a collision. Uh, that is a very close collision right there as real close uh and again this is not unusual we've seen the iranians do this in the persian gulf many many times to commercial vessels to naval vessels the problem is these 110 foot cutters are really small vessels uh and we've seen this with the iranians deta detain american naval vessels mark six patrol boats and it's just part of an escalation of conduct in the straits of hormuz again these key choke points suez canal straits of malacca uh, Straits of Hormuz, the Bab el Mandab, uh, which is the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, are all key choke points. And we're seeing a lot of action going on there, which could have impact on global trade. If, if the Straits of Hormuz is contested, a good chunk of the world's oil comes out of there, not so much to the United States, but to nations like China, Japan, India, and Europe. And that will have an impact across the board. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of What's Going On in Queen Dao. The Racing is Rubbing edition. Uh, I'm Sal Mercagliano. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, share with your friends, get out, get the word out there. If they want a little tidbit of information in the maritime sector, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, try to keep them short, try to keep them entertaining. And with plenty of links over to news sources so that if you're interested, you can link over to them. Please do it. Please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted when new videos come out. And also give it a thumbs up so we can get more uh, views on, on, on YouTube. And the more thumbs up I get, the more they'll put that video out into some people's feeds. So for this edition of What's Going On off of Quingdao slash Suez, I'm Sal Mercagliano. Thanks for tuning in.